To continue our conversation around security, uh, we have our second speaker, who is Professor Sarunas Lekish, Dean of the Faculty of Political Science and Diplomacy at the Vytautas Magnus University in Lithuania. So, you're all set up. Ready yeah, to thank go. you very thank much you very for the invitation. Time. Thank you very much for the possibility to, spo to speak to this respected audience. And the topic, the Baltics as an EU gray zone in the Russian systemic narrative, I think um, is very important because uh, in this audience, when we try to make uh, out of uh, Nordic Baltic 8 plus island a subject, out of, you know, in international law, at least in cooperation, etc., etc., we, we have the other actors which are trying to claim uh, this space. And one of the main uh, participants of this international rivalry is uh, Russia. Uh, right now we understand that the uh, main priority, probably priority number one is Ukraine and Middle East together with Syria. But the second priority, and this you, you can hear in every international conference, is um, Arctic. Okay, so this, in a sense, Nordic dimension. The Baltics actually, though, the Baltics are very often, I mean, drumming the, uh, about the Russian threat, but the Baltics probably are the third in priorities in terms of um, foreign policy and military buildup. Um, however, the Baltics are important because they are kind of good case uh, which demonstrates uh, not only this balance of power which exists in uh, in the region, and the Baltics are the case where we have this balance of power. We have much stronger potential on the eastern side with the Russians, and we have much weaker potential in the in the in the west. Um, however, we have the case also of competing narratives. Usually, um, all strategic community, when they speak about narratives, they get into this historical stuff. I mean, just justification of you know. W Certain claims, the Russians are using it also extensively. We know the case of Crimea. Um, uh, however, uh, when we speak about systemic narratives, systemic narratives um, are closely related uh, to the place of uh, the state and international system. In a sense, we speak about the past, present, and the future. And um, my talk is related to our big policy paper, which we are still in progress, you know, um, writing with the Institute for Policy Analysis, um, uh, Vilnius Institute for Policy Analysis. And um, here we try basically to, co to connect communication science and political science and uh, international relations. And uh, we basically say that uh, syst systemic narratives cannot be understood in isolation from the identity and policy narratives that interact and intersect with um, Basically, when we speak about Russia, Russian projects um, and their systemic and strategic narrative uh, seeks to in reinforce Russia's global prestige and authority whilst promoting multilateral legal and institutional constraints on the other more powerful actors as a means to ensure that Russia stays among the top ranking um, great powers. And here I give some examples of, you know, let's say uh, the basis on what we try to construct our argument. And uh, though at the very beginning I just want to make a small remark, uh, the minister, uh, when he gave, uh, you know, welcoming speech, he spoke about, you know, let's say different age, uh, but uh, different age related, uh, you know, closely and intermitted with technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we study narratives, we notice that majority of them people basically are able to operate only in the system of narratives, but not, um, not to have kind of inductive thinking based on facts and um, evidence, and um, deduction is the most what people are, ca you know, 90% of people in the street are capable of doing. I hope in our audience is very different, but uh, the, the, these are the findings of psychologists and um, uh, opinion researchers. Um, but uh, when we come back to the Russian claims and their systemic narratives, we should stress that um, uh, they dispute uh, fundamentally the set of rules, norms, and institutions that govern the region, the regional order. Um, 
The issue is that originally uh, send the relationship of the rails and remains at the core of the broader dispute is the com uh, competition over, for example, Ukraine, uh, other states in between, Belarus, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. However, at the same time, there is another lay of arguments and um, the whole uh, uh, very similar argument which is, um, is disputing the um, uh, and uh, which is disputing the present uh, status of the Baltic states, Finland, for example, Poland, uh, all the central, central Europe. And uh, these arguments um, are put forward in, um, uh, with the arguments uh, taken from international law. And uh, basically, though the West and all our, probably the countries of Nordic Baltic aid for sure, um, uh, they largely understand inter inter international law and democracy to have universal normative and technical characteristics. Uh, however, when you will listen to the Russian participants of numerous conferences, um, the papers presented, for example, with RAND Corporation or with the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, basically the Russians stress on, put the stress on plural civilizations, um, uh, and basically, they undermine the possibility of a shared normative basis for institutions. Uh, however, there is a problem because in the West, um, and very often, especially when we go to the West-West, like France, Germany, the Russian effort is received most often as a universalist. While if you go down deep in, into the arguments, you see that this is actually a local R Russian projection of its systemic narrative. And basically, the Russian narrative is based on power, uh, on power argument, and, um, and I would claim that uh, despite, um, in spite of the current fixation with this uh, disinformation and Russian-led information warfare, and very often, I mean, we have all kind of kinds of uh, gatherings of strategic communities, uh, stratcoms, you know, big effort on disinformation. When you look at the projects uh, funded by all international organizations, disinformation is a kind of a core in uh, all this. Um, uh, Russia has been uh, uh, very coherent in drawing on a security imaginary, on a security imaginary, which sets limits on how much scope for adaptation in Russia's narratives for international order there is. It, it, does want, it doesn't want to surrender or to make con uh, concessions arguing about power balance. Uh, also, Russia projects a strategic narrative that seeks to reinforce Russia's global prestige and authority whilst promoting multilateral, legal, and institutional constraints on the other more powerful actors as a means to ensure that Russia stays among the top-ranking great powers. And here, we have, because we have only two minutes left, and here, uh, basically, uh, the strongest narratives are uh, so-called influence narratives, influence narratives. And influence narratives basically claim that um, Russian uh, sovereignty trans uh, transcends uh, into the other states. And uh, the whole international order is predefined by agreements between superpowers. So if anybody is giving in, like Trump in Syria, this is the situation which is favorable to Russia. Um, Basically, what are the effects of all this? That while further, furthering Russia's goals, the, ra the narrative diminishes trust in NATO and US, encourages doubt in US motives in Europe, and supports needs for um, kind of need for dialogue mantra. So the dialogue, and the, the, if you look also at the international initiatives recently, at the UN, for example, the, which has um, uh, a lot of initiatives related to the dialogue and trust building initiatives. Basically, this is which is going in the interest of the Russian, Russian stance. Um, another narrative very shortly, because we have only two minutes, um, basically US and West destabilizes Eastern Europe. This is another narrative which is very, very strongly um, expressed. For example, when you look at the, with the US withdrawing from INF, um, uh, when it comes to supporting the sanctions uh, on Russia, NATO enlargement, and et cetera, et cetera. So we can go during the discussion in details. 
Uh, then there is, uh, in short to mention, restoring security order narrative. Uh, basically, a European security order is in disarray and West and Russia needs to return to the essential treaties. And the essential treaties may, basically mean, you know, taking into account the Russian uh, influence and their interest. Uh, then another very interesting um, narrative is uh, about the defendability of the Baltic states. And basically, this kind of argument about defendability of one place or another place is very often used uh, when it comes uh, even you know, to present Syrian affairs. For example, if you look um, uh, what Russian arguments are regarding the Kurds, Turks, etc., etc. So defendability of the Baltic states and of the Nordic states is important as well. And basically, the claim is that uh, most of the, I mean, potentially the places for uh, the Russian uh, place of, uh, for Russian um, influence are non-defendable because of their geopolitical position. So the neutrals are also very often put in this position. I mean, if you, you know, try to read what Russians are writing, basically, the neutrals are be uh, neutrals because they are not defendable. Okay, so it's like to remember to the Nordics, you know, very often when they are putting forward this um, um, neutrality argument. Um, and um, because uh, they are not defendable, they, you need extra force, you know, to defend them. And therefore, uh, this is militarization of any of all these places, let's say Baltics, Nordics, etc., is detrimental for the internal affairs of the countries slows down the economic development and encourages emigration or immigration, whatever argument is used. And um, uh, basically when we come to the conclusion what to do, the question is basically, I think that one of the main problems is to overcome cultural divide in, in, in EU, first at EU level, and then when we come to the Nordic Baltic uh, dimension. But uh, first I mean to overcome this cultural divide where uh, very often everybody to the east, I mean the new members of EU are seen somehow culturally and economically, civilizationally inept, closer to the Russian world, okay, so it's like then it's uh, the Russian arguments are usually met uh, this kind of um, uh, modest support. So I think uh, the the main thing is, you know, to increase cooperation. I think Nordic Baltic uh, format plus island is a very good tool for that. I mean, and in the future, I think uh, it will create all kind of additional uh, possibilities to overcome this kind of militant uh, Russian um, uh, argument about uh, their spheres of influence. Thank you very much.